Well, Jay, I'm so excited about this. Uh, I want to jump in uh, to you starting this business. So you're the ripe young age of 17. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about like, were you wired naturally as an entrepreneur and what did business look like whenever you first started it yeah. at the age of 17? I do think that I was wired as an entrepreneur. Like people debate this topic. It's like nature versus nurture, you know? And I, I think sometimes it's both, but for me, for whatever reason, I did always have that bent. Maybe it was because I saw family members that did it. My grandfather owned a restaurant chain. My uncle owns an insurance agency. And so maybe it's just seeing other people like makes you go, maybe I could do that. Um, I, mean, I started my first business. I was eight years old, pulling a little red wagon around the baseball field, selling concessions out of it. <laughs> I love that. And that's still a business, right? Um, now you need- Wait, a, when you say that's still a business, are you still doing that? No, like on the that weekends? Funny oh, okay. if I was. Oh my God, there was my little red wagon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like now you'd probably need a permit for that anyway. So yeah. I didn't have one back then. <laughs> but when I was 17, it wasn't really about starting a business. It was about doing something that I enjoyed, that I also was able to make money at. I had been building websites and things like that um, as a hobby. And then I also worked for a company um, doing an internship basically when I was in high school. And at some point I thought, you know what? I think I could do this myself. This could be a business. And... But I mean, that first year, like most people wouldn't even qualify as a business. I think I made $5,500 total revenue the first year. So, but when you're 17, like how much do you need, you know? That's right. That's a pretty exciting day. And right. it's a lot more than a lot of other 17 year olds <laughs> right. are making. So at what point, because at, for a period, it was really like you were working a job and you just happened to be self-employed working a job. Yeah. And at some point you graduated to know I'm going to start building this thing beyond myself. And you start bringing on more people and doing different types of work, things like that. When did that transition happen for you? Well, I'm kind of a slow learner. So it took me a long time. I mean, I worked by myself for many years, probably five, six years, and did all the work myself. And then eventually I started hiring contractors because because ultimately what would happen was I was pretty good at selling and I would outsell my ability. Mm -hmm. So I would sell things that I really didn't know how to do, but I was comfortable knowing that I could either figure out how to do them or what was the better choice, which took me a while to learn, was find someone else who know, knew how to do it themselves. And so I'd use contractors for a long time to help accomplish whatever the project was. Um, and I did that for probably 10 years. Man, and so at, like throughout that stage, are you reading books and learning about the building of a business? Or are you literally just like making decisions based on like, this is what I need to do because I just sold this job and I need someone to do the work? Yeah, I wish that I had been doing that. I wish that I had been reading and studying and learning about business as I do now. Um, but I really wasn't, I was just winging it. I was just trying to figure <laughs> out how to put one foot in front of the other. And I think that most people can wing it really to probably eight, nine, 10 people, and maybe even a million dollars. Like it is possible, like if you have the right tenacity and drive, but at some point you're probably gonna burn yourself out too. And so there's obviously, um, like that can slow you down some it to did. a degree to wing it in that way. But I would imagine there was also some blessing that came associated with the fact that you just experienced incremental growth step by step. And you, like, it doesn't sound like you were even expecting anything exponential. You just were better year over year. And that was it. Like people talk about goal setting methodologies and systems for doing that and stuff like that. And then they worry about competition. And for me, it was always just about beating myself last year. Mm. Like, what did I do last year? Let's be better. Better than that, and I don't just—I don't just mean that in revenue. I mean that in revenue and profitability, and like how good I am at it, and whatever whatever the metrics happened to be that I felt like I needed to be improved in. It was just about beating me from last year. So that that's been a big thing for me, and it still even is. I don't care what competition is doing. I really don't. Like I want to be better than where I am, and and that's really it. Man, we were talking about this. Um this conversation would only be better if we were on a boat again, Jay. I wish you were on a boat, but we were talking about this kind of idea we were. on your, your boat the other day. And, and we kind of were reflecting on the fact that it's like, there's obviously value in setting goals. And I think we can both agree that, that like goals are a good thing for business in general. Yeah. And at the same time, maybe you would resonate with this as well. Some of the most stressed out people I know just happen to be some of the most goal oriented people I know. And I'm starting to say, maybe that's not a coincidence. So can you speak to the fact that it's like you weren't putting these, these external pressures on you that are literally arbitrary and made up to just be like, we're going to double or triple or 10 X in size it was just like, we're just going to be better. We're going to yeah. be better than what we were. Do you think that was helpful for you mentally and emotionally? 
I think that it was, but I also, you know, I did have like mentors in my life that helped a lot. You know, there was a season in business where I didn't think I was going to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I was making maybe $25,000, you know, and I, my wife and I just gotten married. We got married really young. We were 21. And, um, I went to work for my uncle in the insurance business because I thought I can't make this marketing agency, design agency thing work. I can't make enough money. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. That's what that's what my inside was telling me. Mm. And he had a great business and he needed an exit plan and I needed an entry plan. And so I went to work for him for six months and I knew I'd married the right woman when one day I went home and I was like, crying because I'm a bit of a crier. And I said, uh, <laughs> okay, that's not what your son said. No, your no. son said, oh, he's a total crier. Am, he cries I am all a total the time. Crier. That's fair. <laughs> and I, and I, and I just said, babe, I, I can do this, but I think I'm going to hate it. And she said, so quit and follow your dreams. Mm. And the next day I left, I, I went in, sat down with my uncle and cried because I'm a crier. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and I told him I was leaving. But my point in saying that is that six months that I had with him was incredible mentorship. Mm. I learned a lot about business because I did business. I, I sat and listened to him talk to clients on phone calls. I'll never forget, there was a lady that called one time. I don't remember her name or what she was upset about, which is probably good, And but she was angry. Mm. And she was like, I mean, she was yelling and screaming. I'd never heard even somebody talk like that on the phone. Like my parents didn't talk like that to each other. I, I wasn't around people who like screamed like this. Mm. This lady was angry. And by the end of the call, the lady was like, oh, Tim, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have been. And I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, and ultimately, he just empathized with her. He listened to her. And he helped not worry about what happened in the past, but plot a, a plan forward. Mm -hmm. And now when that happens, I can't always, I'm not like a magician. I can't always make that happen. And thankfully, I don't have that many people yelling at me on the phone either. But but I learned so much. And so even though I wasn't in business books and podcasts and YouTube and stuff like that, that we have access to now, um, that season of mentorship helped incredibly. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like that was a, it was a pretty pivotal decision for you to leave that place yeah. because I would assume that probably rep, like represented a lot of security and a lot of comfort and probably a lot of financial opportunity yeah. as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that was like, um, there was a lot of hard work ahead, but there was plenty of financial upside. And I knew all I had to do was follow the system and do what I was told mm -hmm. and I would get it done. And you leave for something that is literally the exact opposite of that. Like yeah, I had your certain... latest thoughts of, about it or the thing you're going to are like, I don't know if this can work. Yeah. So what, like, what was it that gave you the courage to say, I'm going to go for it because that feels like a burn the bridges moment. Like we're going to find a way to make this work. Well, I always say you have to have four people in your life. Um, and in this particular case, two of them are involved. I always say you have to have somebody to look up to. That was my uncle in this mm -hmm. case. He helped me learn and, and understand things as a mentor. You need someone to stand beside you. Those are peers, people that are on your level. You need someone who, who, who is looking up to you. So you're teaching somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you need somebody who believes in you when you don't believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And at that point... Like that was Claire. Like she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. If if it like she's not as involved in the business, you know. But but if it had not been for her in that pivotal moment, I would not have done it. Like people look at me now and they're like, "Oh, that's so easy for you. You're so confident and you're so outgoing." And I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. Like that's not true at all. That's mm. not that's not who I was then, you know." And and I had her who believed in me. It doesn't have to be a spouse. It could be a friend or it could be a, a neighbor or a mentor or a parent. It could be any, any number of different kind of people. But, but if you're going to go into business for yourself, you have to have someone because there is going to be a moment where you go, was this a bad idea? Like, do I have what it takes? Mm. And, and she helped push me through that. And because of that, you know, the business has grown every single year since then. Which that's a pretty amazing statement to just kind of gloss by. It's grown every single year. So you're 22, 22 years in business. Years, yeah. And it has literally grown year over year, every single year. Yep. Every year we've grown, even last year, which was a little bit sketchy uh, for a bit <laughs> with the pandemic. Uh, to be fair, we were only up 1%, but we did grow. That's I'll take insane. 1%. And I, we were getting towards the end you of the year. You were going to pull out your wagon and start selling candy again just to hit that 1%. It's like we have to beat last year. I always beat myself from the year before. But even that, like frankly, is probably not that healthy of a perspective at some point. Yeah. Like a growth for growth's sake 
is not necessarily wise, mm, you know. Preach that. That that is our like mo, like growth for the sake of growth. Yeah, it, like it's dead. It's there's no point. Right. But if there's a compelling reason why to grow, yeah. then that that'll keep you going. Um, so I was sitting back reflecting and thinking about this conversation, and like one of the things you know we talk about at Path for Growth is we help impact driven leaders, which is you through and through practice healthy growth, mm. and we're constantly spending time right now assessing and looking at that phrase, what does it mean to practice healthy growth? And one of the things that I really responded to, I first heard Tony Robbins teach it, but he didn't come up with it. It's just this idea that there's six core human needs, mm -hmm. right? And you and I were kind of talking about this before we recorded. And as I was prepping the things that I wanted to talk to you about, I just thought about the fact that like, man, there's so much to admire about where Jay is at right now and where his business is at right now. And you would be the first to say you're not perfect. But I also think like there's a lot of stuff because you've been doing this for 22 years that like you've learned a lot. And as I kind of wrote down the things that I thought would be great to talk about, I realized, man, you can literally overlay these six core needs mm -hmm. and it's like you can see them showing up for Jay. And and I think it's one of the difference makers behind sitting across from an entrepreneur like you that you've grown year over year every single time and you can sit here and you can say, I'm closer to my family, I'm content, I'm enjoying myself, I like my team versus sitting across someone that has grown every year and they're miserable yeah. and both can occur, right? And so what I thought would be fun would be to walk through these six needs and literally just talk about where where do these show up in your life? Like where do you struggle with these some? And and like how do you go about building these for the entrepreneurs, the impact driven leaders that we're talking to? Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Love okay. it. I know I put you on the spot with this today, so I didn't give you <laughs> any okay. problems with great. it. So okay, so let's run through them a high level, and then and then we'll kind of jump through each one. So there's six of them. The first one is certainty, and so you need stability and order. The second one is uncertainty. The third one is human connection. The fourth one is contribution. The fifth one is growth. And the final one is significance. So let's start with certainty and order and stability. Um, the first thing I would ask you is as a person and just like the way that you're wired, are you wired to create certainty and order or are you more wired to create chaos? I'm wired to create chaos. Chaos, right? No okay. question about it. But I'm but I married someone who's wired to create certainty and oh, order. Well, that's a good thing. And and I would say in business too. That was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, it was necessary. Trust me. The, the example my, my uncle always gives, I think, is really good. He always says, "I'm the kite, she's the string." Mm. But kites don't fly well without strings. Mm. And and that's that's exactly how Claire and I are. But in business, it's very similar too. If you look at the personality makeup of our team, for me, anybody who's ever studied the DISC personality profile, which I know you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a high D, high I, which means mm -hmm. I'm ready to get things done. Let's just go do it. Let's get it done. I want to have fun doing it. My wife is a high CD, um, which means she wants things in order. She wants them done right. She wants the details. She wants all the details before we do them. And I have a lot of those team members on my team ironically, not ironically, intentionally, <laughs> here um, at Business Builders because um, I know that I need that counter. So mm. the certainty is something that I've had to learn because otherwise, if, if I operate in my natural state, which is chaos for the most part, I'm gonna burn everybody else out around me. Mm. And you can't grow a team like that. And so certainty has been a learned behavior for me and it's something we've put in place with very intentional things um, at the company that that have revolutionized how we operate and, and create consistency and create clarity, which I think most team members want. Yeah, I, I love that you use those two words, consistency and clarity, um, because I, I think that really in the environment of an organization, that's what certainty looks like, consistency and clarity. So can you speak to some of the things that you have put in place as a business to create an environment of certainty for the team, but also to create a, a environment of rhythm and stability for yourself as the leader of this business? Yeah, there's certain things that we do the same way all the time. It hasn't always been like that. These are things we've improved over time. Um, for example, even though we kind of like were harping on goals a little bit earlier, the company has certain annual goals that everybody knows what those are. And then we have quarterly objectives, or we call them quarterly rocks, that help us achieve those goals. So over the next 90 days, what are we going to get done? 
And in order for that to be clearly communicated and everybody to be on the same page and that we're all rowing in the same direction, we have a quarterly team meeting that we try and have a little fun in there and have a fun lunch. Maybe sometimes we'll do some games. We'll bring in a, a training like you came in and did ownership mentality training for us, which was awesome. And, and so everybody knows like once a quarter, we're going to stop doing all the work. We're going to shut down the tasks. Everybody has permission to turn off their phones, ignore their emails and focus on working on themselves individually and on the team and on the business itself. And because we have those quarterly meetings and they're always consistent and we always follow the same plan, everybody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it's still, there's still some flexibility because I mean, even we had our quarterly meeting yesterday and, and there were things that didn't get done last quarter because other things popped up that needed to be dealt with. And that's okay. There's always gonna be a little bit of chaos in a small growing organization, but there has to be this anchor, this cornerstone. And that's what those quarterly meetings are for us. It creates um, certainty for me and for the team. We know where we're going. Mm, that's so powerful because I think most leaders would say, yes, I believe that time together is really important. I obviously believe that communication is important and I believe that ongoing development is important for my organization. Very few of those leaders have it scheduled. Mm. And it's like what you're telling me is like, there's an immovable time once a quarter that like we've already booked, like it's already there and it's going to happen. And really then the question just becomes, well, what, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna talk about? Right. And you just plug and play the content and stuff like that. Yeah, and in addition to that, like for me personally, as a leader, I firmly believe in the idea that an organization can outgrow its leader. Mm. And and so for me, I'm constantly putting myself in places where I'm getting challenged, I'm being held accountable, I'm getting stretched a little bit. Um, I'm involved in um, a, an organization called C12. Yeah. We have a monthly group that's super like, everybody signed non-disclosures to be in this group. It's that That's kind right. of level. And we will put anything on the table, faith, family, finances, business, and we're held accountable to those things. And that's one full day a one month, One full correct? day a month I inject and in, I invest in that. Like yeah. that's a pretty massive investment, but that's, I would assume that's also a meeting you're not missing, right? Like you're going to that meeting. That's right, I'm in person. Because they're counting on you being there. And so it's like, even that as a rhythm that it's like, well, I can get 29 days off track and that one day out of the month is going to be the thing that snaps me back and be like, dude, this is what you said you were going to do. That's pretty powerful to have that in place. It absolutely is. And as a leader, you have to have other people to hold you accountable. You have other people to bounce ideas off of who are, you know, in the trenches just like you. Mm -hmm. And people always say like, it's lonely at the top. It doesn't have to be. That's right. Like you can put yourself in community. I mean, the other community I've been involved with for a long time is the Entre Leadership community, one you're very familiar with. That's right. And yeah, that's uh, where we met, which right, is awesome. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> that's right. And uh, I mean, I just love that, that space, that community, the principles. And I have a call now, uh, twice a month actually for like an hour and a half um, with both a coach and several other business leaders who we've mm. been in for a long time. And um, I mean, that space is very valuable. Mm. And, and and it seems, the thing is, if you had told me I was going to do that like 10 years ago, I'd be like, I don't have time for one of those things, much less both of them, <laughs> you know? That's right. But now I think, man, I, I, I couldn't not have time for that. Mm -hmm. I have to do these things. If I don't do these things, I don't have the resources to lead well. And if I don't have the resources to lead well, then I'm not caring for my team. If I'm not caring for my team, then, then nobody's going to do very well. That's right. So speaking to a lot of people that would describe themselves as impact driven. What well, one one of the things that we've recognized is a lot of times you can take that title and overlay it with visionary, right? And so we're talking okay. to a lot of people right now that would very much resonate with you, which is they would say, I am naturally wired to love chaos. Yeah. I love the uncertain, I love the unknown, and I'm constantly thinking of new ideas and pressing into new territory. And I love an open schedule that's flexible. I don't love these immovable blocks that are on my schedule that look like a prison, right? Yeah. What is the message that you would tell that person? I mean, it's just a question of like, do you want to take as much as you might thrive in chaos or the whirlwind or you think that you do? Because that is me. Like that's my that's my style is at some point, you, you know what that feeling is where you're sitting there late one night working on that new project that you started on top of everything else and the thing that you took on because nobody else could do it as well as you. And, and in the midst of that, like you are sacrificing your marriage or your children, or your friends, or yourself, your own mental health, your physical health. And I have done all of those things. Mm -hmm. I have made all those mistakes and still 
I still don't have them perfect to be really, really clear. Have a propensity right. for making that's, them again. Huh? I do because that's Which that's I think my even nature. the awareness that like, you know, I am always one decision, one bad decision away from stepping back into that whirlwind or that chaos. Yeah, because I like to work and there's that's nothing right. wrong with that. And a lot of people listening probably feel the same way, but I also want the freedom like to be able to take a break when I want to mm -hmm. and, and be able to have the freedom that I don't have to always have my phone on me. I don't have to always have my laptop on me. I can take a day off or a week off or a month off and and the business still thrive without me. That's 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 critical to me for not just my own legacy, but like for all the people that, you know, care for this business along with me. That's right. One piece before we move on from this certainty topic that I think you kind of hit at the beginning was you've done an incredible job of hiring for your weaknesses. Like you have a lot of people on your team that if you look at their disc profile or their Enneagram, they, it looks very different than yours, right? And so can you speak to the value of doing that and anything that you've learned with regard to hiring your weakness? Well, I mean, the hard thing about it is when you hire your weakness, um, you may not have the easiest time getting along with that person. Hmm. And so, like, I mean, there are team members of mine, like, who probably know who they are, that when we have to work on projects together, when we get to work on projects together, I should say, <laughs> like, there's conflict. We, we just did this big live event, first, first type of event we'd ever done uh, here at the end of March this year. And... Um, I had two of my team members who were leading that charge and they are very different personalities than me. And there were meetings leading up to planning that where I was like, oh my gosh, like I cannot handle another detail. Like this is insane. <laughs> and they know that, like I mean, we've, we've talked about it and laughed about it. But at the same time, when I showed up for that event, all I did was walk on stage and teach everything else was taken care of. Mm. Why? Because I had the people in place who dealt with all those things and everybody came up to me and were like, man, this is amazing. How many of these have you done? And we're like, oh, this is our first one. And it, it felt and looked like a team who had done this thing for 10 years. Mm -hmm. because, because I know how to hire people that don't, don't just act like I do. The, the problem is, especially for those of us that lean high eye, we love to be around other high eyes in some instances because it's just a big party. Um, but then when we get down to work, we actually don't work very well together at all. And we need the opposites in those scenarios. I love that uh, that as an example because I think that so uh, perfectly illustrates what it looks like to practice healthy growth because it's like, the event represents a destination. Mm -hmm. And of course we want the destination to be beautiful. But I think sometimes we get this expectation in our head that because the destination is going to be beautiful, every day leading up yeah. to the destination yeah. is also <laughs> going to be beautiful. But my assumption is that one of the reasons why there was value in those meetings ahead of time is you had the expectation like, we're going to disagree on stuff. This is going to be messy. There's going to be times where I'm annoyed and they hate me and we're at each other's throats. And that's just part of the gig. And having that expectation probably really helps. But to some extent, like talking about certainty, that is certainty. So there is certainty in knowing yes. that there are going to be problems here. Yeah. And that's going to be fine, you know? And and I think the reality of that is if everybody communicates that up front, it changes everything. I, I always say that expectations are the biggest reason the relationship fall, falls apart. And mm. communication is the bridge that connects those expectations. And if going in, we all know, like, this is probably going to have some bumpy spots along the way. And when we do, that's okay. We're just going to press right through them. But that, again, that's not like to pretend like it's all just fun and games along the way, you know, like, but, but you have to have all those different types of people on board and they all have to be still rowing in the same direction, but in, in their gifts and strengths mm -hmm. so that we can all accomplish what the end goal is. I love it. Okay. So it was so interesting whenever I first heard this teaching is it's like, okay, yes, you need certainty. And then immediately the next thing you need is the exact opposite of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's uncertainty because if we get too certain on things, we become complacent, we become lazy, right? And this is not probably something you have to worry about is the idea that it's like, we're not going to have enough uncertainty. But I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can always do what we've always done. So can you speak to maybe some of the practical ways that uncertainty shows up for you and for the business? Well, I think there's a couple things. Number one, if you are really good at running a business, which it took me a long time to figure that out, and I'm still learning, that at some point, things should become really certain. And they frankly should become pretty comfortable. And if they're if they haven't, then you're, there's something that you're missing along the way. But for me, I always say that I'm the least comfortable when I'm the most comfortable, <laughs> because one of two things I believe is true. Either one, 
I'm not learning or growing and I'm not stretching myself. I'm not improving. And if that's the case, like I'm really not interested in it just based on my personality. And the second is I always feel like I'm missing something. Mm. That's a, that's a blessing and a curse mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, but I also always say to our team, I think one of the biggest pains or mistakes that a lot of people make is saying, well, this is how we've always done it. That's right. And I always say, look, we should only do it how we've always done it. If that's still the best way to do it. Mm. And maybe that should be the default. Maybe we should go, hey, this is how we've always done it. And if somebody else goes, well, hold on, but what if we did this instead? Well, that looks way better. Let's do that. And then we just change, you know? Mm. And I don't even think people are afraid of change. I think it's the uncertainty of it all that, that, that they are afraid of. But good leadership should take that level of uncertainty and go, I understand that, but we need a little bit of this so that we can improve. And this is true in everything. Like when you go to the gym... If you go to the gym and you work out, which I haven't done in a while, but <laughs> and you come back the next day and you and you're not sore at all, did you even work out? Yeah. Like really? Like if you if you if you feel no pain, no 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 um, stress or no strain, then you have a problem, you know, because you probably didn't really get much done. If you go work out and you didn't sweat, like did you work out? I mean, maybe it's better than doing nothing, whatever you did. Mm-hmm. But but in business, I think it's the same way. There, there should be a few things that are a little bit uncomfortable, there, a few things that we're not quite sure of. But I think that good leadership is is showing that that there are a certain number of things that are certain, and there's a few things that we're not quite sure about, but we're just going to keep stepping into it to figure out where we can go. And I, that's why I'm a big believer of slow growth, because... If I'm moving slowly and I make a mistake, it's not that bad. If you're driving a car and you're driving it slowly and you crash it, it's not that bad. If you're driving a car and you're going 100 miles an hour and you crash it, you're probably not making it out alive. That's right. Right? And business is not that far off from that. And so I think there has to be some elements of uncertainty, but they have to be almost intentional um, in the midst of all the chaos. And chosen. Like uh, Jordan Peterson, who I know you're a fan of yeah. too, I, I make a point of quoting him on just every podcast episode because <laughs> I feel like my listeners feel like they listen to Jordan Peterson if, even if they don't. Um, he One of my favorite definitions of where he thinks success comes from is he says, optimal struggle undertaken voluntarily. And apparently there is psychological evidence that shows that struggle undertaken voluntarily versus involuntarily, like the way we perceive that mentally and emotionally is massively different. Yeah. And so it's like what you've opted in for is like, we're going to step into struggle and we're going to do it on purpose and we're going to choose it. Because I feel like what we saw happen with COVID in so many ways, and and I don't want to make light of the situation at all, but we saw so many people that coasted for a really long time that were suddenly pushed into struggle yeah. and and they were they did it by force, not by volunteerism, right? They didn't opt in for it, obviously, and they had no clue how to handle it. And their team dissolved, right? Just overnight because they weren't ready for that level of uncertainty. But it seems like when that happened for y'all, of course, you weren't ready for a global pandemic, right? right? Because no one was fully prepared for that. But it wasn't like you had to fully teach your team on the fact that sometimes we do things we've never done before. And that's just part of the gig. But but think about that as it relates to even like a child or the darkness, for example. People aren't inherently afraid of the dark. Mm. They're afraid of what they don't know that might be in the dark. But if you spend a lot of time in the dark, you're not as afraid of it anymore. That's right. B- because it, it's not the dark that you're afraid of. And you have enough experience going, you know what? Like I know how to kind of feel my way around. And, and, and that really is the difference. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of this. After 22 years, we just changed our company name. And we're doing a lot, mostly the same services with some, some additions, but we wanted to create more clarity on what we do. So for 22 years, from the time I was 17 years old, we've been known as Design Extensions. And as of like last week, we're now business builders. Yeah, which that, like, some people, like, their mind is blown right now. So many people. That's a massive shit. Like, that's huge to be able to decide 22 years in, like, well, now sounds like a good time to change the name of this A lot of people, I mean, most people that I tell that to, they're like, wait, what? You're changing your company? What about this? What what about your brand awareness? I'm like, look, unless you're Apple or Nike or, like, Patagonia, you're like, you probably don't have as much brand awareness (laughs) as you think that you have, number one. And number two, sometimes change actually creates attention as well. So, mm. and we're, that's, that's what we're in the business of is getting attention and acquiring customers. So 
we can create attention with our own brand change. And I'm not afraid of that. Is it a little bit uncertain? Is, is there a part of me that's like, oh, but that's been my thing for a long time? And sure. But I think that the opportunity out outweighs the risk. Gosh, I uh, I heard this story. They were opening Epcot at Disney World, um, and Roy Disney was walking around at the grand opening, and there were reporters asking him questions and stuff. And one of the reporters asked him the question, like it was kind of like a, a side jab question, just literally got in his face and said, "Isn't it horrible that Walt didn't get to see this?" And like that was the first question. It's like total jerk, like mm -hmm. total jerk move. That that's what you're going to ask his brother is the one question you're asking him. And Roy apparently paused. This is the story. Roy paused and said. I see why you are simply a reporter and not a visionary leader. Mm -hmm. Because what you need to understand is that Walt saw this a long time ago. Yeah, that's right. Walt saw it way before you ever got to see it. And like and it's like that's part of leadership and yeah. sometimes if you're not careful, you can get so comfortable in the known, I think, in what's certain, which is a human need, that you start avoiding uncertainty yeah. and I think that is where businesses go to die. It is. Yeah, it's super dangerous. And, and and the more time you spend in the dark, the better you can see in the dark. Mm. That's all there is to it. Yeah. But you don't want to live in the dark, you know? Like, And I think that's the balance between certainty and uncertainty is I've never really thought of it like that until you kind of brought this framework back um, that's Tony Robbins. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought through these six ideas that we're talking through. But then as we look at them, I'm like, yeah, those, those are things that I have unintentionally sought. Mm -hmm. and, and and part of that is it's taken me a long time. I wish, I wish somebody had laid this out for me 22 years ago, I might have been a little bit quicker off the gate. It's so helpful to evaluate too, because you can even, I mean, that's the thing, whenever you start seeing patterns of content, you can start to put it all together. And it's like Jordan Peterson talks about certainty and uncertainty too. Yeah, for sure. He just talks about it as order and chaos. Yeah. And what he always says is like, are you order or are you chaos or are you the force that mediates between the two? Mm. And it's like, I've thought about that a lot in the context of business of what does it look like to have a business that operates as the force that mediates between order and chaos. Mm. And it looks a lot like being really freaking good at what you're doing and then also having the guts to courageously change your name after 22 years. Like that's insane. So the final question on this uncertainty piece is that's right up your alley, right? You can pull the trigger on changing the name of the company pretty aggressively. I would imagine there's people on your team that because you've hired your weaknesses, like they, they don't as naturally see all the justification for that and why that's actually the right move. How do you make sure that you're bringing them along for that ride, not begrudgingly, but you're bringing them along in a way that it's like, oh no, I, I want to do this because I see the value in this. Well, I think number one, you it can't just be your idea. Hmm. Like, matter of fact, the name isn't even my idea. Like it came from, as we were planning for the event, I mean, Allie and Hannah, who are kind of my uh, right hand, I don't know, ladies on that, they, they they helped plan the vast majority of that event and they really came up with the name and, and in some of our brainstorming sessions, we were trying to figure out what to call it. And we were naming the event, not the company. Mm. The event was called Business Builders Live. And as we kind of looked at it more and more and the branding that had been created for the event, and we had been talking about renaming the company at some point because the old name, Design Extensions, people either thought we were a pure design agency, which isn't an accurate description of us, or a hair extensions company, <laughs> neither one of which is true. So when actually, I was at an event one time. You mean you don't offer that? No, no. <laughs> we do have a barber chair in the office, but that's a different thing. It's funny, we were at an event one time, and uh, I had told this story about the name change, and this lady spoke up afterwards, and she's like, I didn't want to say it, but she's like, I actually, when I saw your name, thought you were a hair extensions company. <laughs> and so the name, number one, it, it can't just be your idea. Number two, you have to be patient like with the rollout and the timing. Like, it's not like I decided last week we were gonna change the company name. Now the old me might've done something like that. I might've been like, hey, we're gonna change everything and we're gonna do it next week. I knew that I had to give it a lot of breath. Mm -hmm. And so we've probably been talking about the idea for a year or more maybe, probably more than that. And then, and then I've gotta create enough room to go, hey, I'd like to have this done by this date. And that has to be a long enough date in the future. And then the people that are super detailed and need certain things done in order to feel like, they're proud of what we've accomplished. I need to give them time and space to accomplish those things. And I need to push it along a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when people start sending me feedback on stuff, I'm not gonna be the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there were a lot of times where people were asking me feedback on like the new website and things like that. And I was like, 
is it better than the old one? And they're like, yeah. Does it have the new brand on it? Yeah, launch it. Bingo. <laughs> go that, for it. And I, we'll just make we'll just make it better as we go. That's yeah. the beauty of these digital products we get to work on is it's not like we're creating a, a magazine where we're printing 50,000 of them and we can't change them. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I've shared this with you yet. <laughs> and then I've promised we're going to move on from uncertainty. I could spend the entire episode talking about <laughs> this uncertainty because this Joe is such Rogan a fun podcast. Because oh, <laughs> it's such a fun time when we need some whiskey to make it to Joe Rogan <laughs> podcast. I can make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, like with regard to this topic of uncertainty, I, I always thought I would never be a fiction reader, right? I, I mm. always thought I would never be a fiction reader. And I don't have anything wrong with fiction. I just always naturally respond to nonfiction and I because it feels productive. Suddenly I started the business a year ago i love fiction now and and i'm i'm so deeply immersed in the lord of the rings right now i read it every night and i just love it and one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot is like the reason why i love it is because it's a story about leadership mm -hmm. right and and one of the things that i've kind of been noticing a lot is that if business no longer feels like an adventure that's your fault as the leader oh yeah because like the, the the whole story of the Lord of the Rings is people consistently wading into the unknown and conquering it. And it's like, there's a lot of leaders and I'm susceptible to this as well, that they stop wading into the unknown. And so where I thought of that was like, you didn't just set out and say, we're gonna re revamp the entire company. We're gonna change the name. You set out and said, we're gonna do a live event. And, and there would be people that say, oh, you don't do live events. But it's like, okay, well, that's a great reason why we should do a live event. And y'all did an event and out of that, you got a name. And it's like, all this stuff came from that. Mm -hmm. That's just so cool. I just love that. And I, I admire you for that. And I would challenge everyone that's listening to this is like, if you know you're more wired for certainty, now's a great time to say, how could we voluntarily inject some uncertainty? Yeah. Now, some of you need to not take that advice at all and inject some certainty. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful, <laughs> but yeah. So know who you are. So let's jump to the third one now. We said certainty is number one. Uncertainty is number two, and then human connection is number three. Mm -hmm. um, as I was writing down what I wanted to talk to you about, one of the things that I wrote down that I then realized like, oh, this fits in so perfectly with this framework of the six human needs is you did this monthly supper club. And the way I know about your monthly supper club is you post all the freaking amazing food <laughs> pictures every single time. It's like, y'all don't just order out. You get no. some seriously good food. So speak to us a little bit about what that is and how it started. Yeah, so... Remember earlier I said you need somebody to look up to and somebody to stand beside you. Mm -hmm. And the somebody to stand beside you to me is a, is a peer. It's somebody who's going through a similar season of life um, because we're all at different stages you know, of business, of marriage, of friendship, of parenting, wherever it may be. That's all mm -hmm. different stages of life and it changes. And um, I probably wouldn't have any friends if it wasn't for my wife either. <laughs> not because I'm not like a friendly person. I try and be a friendly person. It's just that like I would probably just work all the time, yeah. you know, and, and, and she is much better at developing those relationships and knowing that we need them. And now I know that we need them too. But um, a while back, it was actually five years ago, um, we started this thing called Supper Club. We didn't even start it. We were invited into it by a good friend of ours. And they were, they were like, hey, we know y'all and we know this couple and we know this couple. And we'd like to get to know you more. And we have this idea. Part of it came from a book that they read. We want to get together every month and we're going to rotate houses and um, we're going to do like a fancy dinner at each other's house. So the way it works real briefly, we're thinking about writing a book about this actually, because it's so great. Well, first of all, before you jump into yeah. how it works, like you told me about that woman starting it after reading yeah. the book. And I, I heard that and I was like, what a great example of the fact that leadership has nothing to do with business necessarily. Like that's oh, yeah. such a good illustration of like, I see this thing, I know that we have a need for it. I assume that there's other people we know that have a need for it as well. And so I'm just gonna step up and make it happen. Like I just, and it's like, she went from certainty, we don't have dinner with people to uncertainty. What if we did this? And some of them may reject me, but I'm going to step into it. And so, okay. So now tell yeah. us how it transpired and how it works. Yeah. So all of us are in similar seasons of life, but they just kind of put us together, uh, this other family that, and we, so we all own businesses, different mm. kinds of businesses. We're all roughly the same age. We've all been married roughly 20 years now. We've all got a bunch of kids. I have five. The couple who started actually now have seven. Um, <laughs> Pray for them. <laughs> know, it's, it's impressive. They're awesome. And um, so we get together once once a month at each other's houses. And if it's at your house, you're doing everything. You're buying the food. You're doing the decorations. And it's, it's all out. One little story, just so people know how hardcore this is. I came home from work one day, and there were these two old coffee tables in the garage. And I was like, hey, babe, what are those coffee tables doing in the garage? She's like, oh, I need you to cut the legs off and make them match the height of our living room coffee table. And I'm like, what? 
And she's like, just do it. I'm like, okay, I've learned sometimes just do it. <laughs> just do what you're told. That's, that's a marriage. Marriage. Just that's do a free, it. That's just a free do marriage it. tip. Just do what you're told. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did that, and she turned the whole living room into this like Moroccan dining room. So we had pillows all around these tables. She put these beautiful tablecloths, had candles everywhere, made all this Moroccan food. That's how hardcore supper club is. <laughs> we don't play around. And going back to certainty or consistency, it ties into that as well as human connection in that we do not miss supper club. We have had it every single month for five years in a row. And these are like people like, well, I'm busy. Okay, well, look, between these four couples, there's almost 20 children. Every single person owns a different business, a jewelry business, a marketing agency, um, uh, a design agency, and uh, a real estate company. Those people are busy. They've got some reasons to miss Supper Club, yeah. and yet they don't miss Supper Club. That's right. Why? Because they've decided that this human connection, and that's not what we would have called it. I'm just calling that because that's what the <laughs> framework says, but it is what it is, is more important than anything else. Mm. And man, in five years, when you have that many kids and you've all been and you're all married and you all run businesses, there's some bad days. Mm. Some really bad days. There are days where you just shed tears at that table. You know, mm. and there's other days where we are just laughing our heads off, yeah, and and just absolutely love each other. I know that if 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 I need somebody at three o'clock in the morning, I can call any of those guys and they'll be there. That's amazing. That that wasn't true for me in the early years of business, though, because I valued the business more than that. And and that now I know I need that as much or more than I do anything that can show up on my P and L. Mm. One of the greatest blessings to me of this whole trip was the fact that I got to go to church with your mm. family on yeah. Sunday. And one of my favorite parts of the message is such a deep point that was made in such a simple way is he was referring to that section of Ecclesiastes where it said there's a, a season for crying, there's a season for dancing, mm. there's a season for mourning, there's a season for celebrating, right? And one of the points that he made out of referencing that section of Ecclesiastes was he said, if you don't cry when you're supposed to cry, you won't be able to dance whenever you're supposed to dance. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought of whenever you talked about these different these different monthly times where it's like sometimes you're going through really rough stuff and then sometimes it's absolutely awesome and that's sometimes right. we're just eating great food together. Right. And it's like, I think the value of that, sure, there's value in one dinner, I would assume. My assumption is that the real value comes from the compounding consistency of this is just something we do. Yeah. And we've been here for five years and if you look up in five years again, we'll probably still be here. And it's just commitment, you know? And, mm. I, and I think that it's so easy in business, especially as a leader, going back to what I said earlier, it's easy to act like it's lonely at the top. If you are lonely as a leader, it is because you have chosen to be lonely. Like, and that is a hard truth to hear because I had to be told that. Like, mm. I'm not saying that like to somebody else who's listening because I like know who they are because I don't. I'm saying it because people said it to me and it was true. Mm. And I decided that I wasn't going to be like that anymore. Yeah. And... And there's, but there's still days because I, because I'll retreat back into those shadow shadow characteristics, and and I have to have people around me that will go, hold on, like, don't be doing that, don't be yeah. doing that. I think one of the things that keeps people lonely, and I can speak from experience here, is if I'm not careful people will connect to the image of Alex instead of actually connecting to Alex. Mm. And then it's like, man, we can have dinner as many times as we want. And I'm never actually going to feel like I got that human connection yeah. thing because this mask that I put up or this image of me may have connected with them, but I didn't actually connect with them. And so one of the things that I'm actively practicing learning right now is like, no, I'm going to connect for real. And I'm going to tell people where I'm really at. And sometimes they can't handle that. And sometimes they actually want the image. And sometimes it's like, okay, well, maybe that's a great point that you're not, like we can connect on a business level but not that's, a friend level it's that's like that's okay but can you speak to that person that maybe they feel lonely not because they're not surrounded by people because a lot of these folks are surrounded by people yeah, yeah. but because they're not being real yeah you know it's interesting that you brought that up because my c12 chair keeps asking me about that because one of the things for us is like we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years not just building the brand of the company but building my own personal brand whether it's my podcast or my book or my own website or my speaking engagements any of that stuff and the danger of that environment which you're is exactly what you're speaking to is all of a sudden you can become the persona of who you are and forget who you are mm. and so i think i think ultimately you have to ask what kind of range of emotions like you have when you're around people too like mm. If you if you do not have friends that you ever cry in front of, that's you're probably not there yet. 
Mm. If you don't have like like you, there has to be some depth of range of emotion, and we're all different. I, mean, I already said earlier, I'm a crier, right? But 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 really, like there has to be some depth of like, where do I stop in what I'm not willing to tell somebody, especially as it relates to my weakness. And and I've seen people do this too, and I probably have been guilty of this at times. Is they'll talk about weaknesses, but only the ones that they want to talk about in order to get empathy. That's right. Vulnerability can be a tactic. 100%. It's so valued now yes. that it can, be, and it's like, man, that number one, that hurts the other person, that's but right. it also hurts you. And so that, like, that's one of the things that makes me so frustrated is when we start to talk about vulnerability as a tool that can be yes. used for leadership. It's like, no, that's not like this is you being humbly aware of what you're actually going through and laying it out there. Yes, and that is, and I think that's that's hard to even figure out because you, because I think I've been in places too, where I've walked far, so far down that road, but, but my wife again, like is really good at seeing that. And she'll say things like, don't talk to me in your speaker voice. <laughs> oh, dang. And I'm like, Claire coming in hot, <laughs> man. And I'm like, oh man, that's a good point. And, and so, but that's a persona coming out. Why? Because that's a position of power. Mm. Because if you're a speaker, you're somebody on stage. Somebody on stage is somebody has a microphone. If you have a microphone, you have power. Mm. And and so when you if you start injecting those traits in places where you shouldn't, like that's a red flag. You yeah. know? And so I I think that I have enough people around me that hold me accountable to that. But it's been interesting because the last few one on ones I've had with my C12 chair, that's one of the things he keeps pressing on. I'm like, well, does he keep pressing on this because he thinks it might be an issue or because he sees it as an issue? Mm. And, and this, that's been something that's like kind of, but, but you have to people around that are going to ask that question. That's right. And so now that he's asking that question, I'm, I'm starting to self-evaluate and go. You're asking yourself the right, question. Well, am I doing that? Because I might be. Yeah. And I think the scary thing, especially when you're somebody who is like a persona or a leader, is you do, there are times where you do have to put on a show. Mm -hmm. There are times where you got to just suck it up and just do it. Like that's, pe people fall off so many sides of this cliff. People are like, you either have to always be vulnerable or always be strong. And I'm like, it's not strong or vulnerable. It's just who you are. But there are times where you got to, you got to just suck it up. And there's other times where you, you can't always do that. You can't always just stuff it back down inside or someday you're going to explode. We all know people that have done that. That's right. And, and none of us want to be like that in the long run. And I think like the question that would be worth everyone who's listening to this asking yourself is like, are there people that you don't have to be quote unquote on for? Yeah. And, and because like we run into people a fair amount that one of the things that they will tell our coaching team is like, this is the one call I can get onto every month that I don't feel like I have to be on, which that's awesome. And I'm so glad that our team can provide that for them, that safe space. And at the same time, that can't only come from people that you're paying. Like 100%. that has to come from people that you are doing life with, preferably like you in your community that you're seeing on a regular basis. So I, I man, go start a supper club like and add yeah. Jay on Facebook to see the pictures <laughs> of their food because it's pretty outrageous. Most okay. of it's not to my credit to be yeah. <laughs> There you go. There you go. You cut the legs off tables. That's though, about and it. That looks pretty good. Okay. So we've got certainty. We've got uncertainty. We've got human connection. The next one is contribution. Um, and so where I thought it would be cool to talk about this is uh, tell us a little bit of the story about how you and Claire are involved in Haiti. And then I'd love to ask some follow-up questions on what that's done for Haiti, but also what it's done for y'all. But tell us a little bit about how that started and what that actually is. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to be, to preface this, I used to kind of be anti-mission trips. Now I've been involved in church my whole life and I'm all about ministry and I'm for missionaries and I'm for like missions, but I didn't think I needed to go on that trip hmm. because I don't, I don't know any other languages. I'm not good at construction. I'm not a very good painter either. At least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> and like, I, don't, I didn't feel like I had anything to contribute so why would I do that, right? And um, we had a really good friend though, um, her name's Shannon, and she spent several years down in Haiti as a missionary. And when she came back, um, long story short, she started a foundation with a, a good friend of hers who lives in Haiti. And Claire has always actually been the opposite of me, surprise, surprise, <laughs> and thought that she wanted to really go on a missions trip and, um, and really be involved. Well, I finally got talked into going because I love Shannon and I believe in her. And I also, side tangent, think that it's valuable for people who are visionaries to be in places where they're not the one who's the visionary. Mm. And so Shannon clearly was the visionary for this foundation, and, and I went on her with her for this first trip. And, um, and when you see 
When, when you go to a place like Haiti, a, a place that truly is impoverished at a level that most of us just can't fathom, mm. and you hear it, and you see it, and you smell it, and you get to know people there, um, it changes you. And and so it's not, it's so interesting because I think when as it relates to mission things like that, people talk about contrib. I mean, the topic here is contribution and giving of time and money primarily, mm-hmm. right? Um, but man, I think that place has probably given me a lot more than I've given it. Um, but as a result of that, now I've been back uh, from going for somebody who didn't believe in mission trips. Now I go almost every single year to the same place, which I actually really like too, because I, I have friends there. Like I have people mm-hmm. that I know and care about and pray for all, all the time. And um, I know their kids' names and I know, you know, I know what they're up to. And, um, and so being engaged in something that far away um, that's a, literally a different world mm. than what we live in um, has enriched my marriage with my wife. It's enriched me personally because I'm involved in something that is so far outside of my own home, so far outside of my own business, so far outside of my own community. And and that has a real impact, you know, in general. Um, and I don't really even mean an impact on Haiti. Like, I think that's selfish. And we have had an impact as a foundation. It's amazing to see what's happened down there. I mean, I mean, even just this um, this past week or two, they just finished a VBS down there. And when I first went down there, there were maybe like eight or 10 kids running around um, on this dirt hill. And now it's this beautiful piece of property with a chapel and all this other stuff going on. They're building a school down there. It's going to be amazing. They had like 200 kids at VBS this week. Oh, praise God. 40 of those kids accepted Christ this oh, week. Oh, holy cow. Oh. And these are people who may have never otherwise heard the name of Jesus. Mm. And to me, like, um, this is one thing that actually created a catalyst for me to like get back into growth mode, actually, because I got to a point where I was comfortable, a little too, it was a little too certain. And it was like, well, you know, you, you reach certain income levels where it's not like I was like super rich or anything. I just had enough money to cover the basic necessities of life. And to me, like based on how I grew up, that was actually really, really good. I could mm. pay my bills. I didn't worry about paying my mortgage. Like, how much more do you really need, you know? And um, when I went to Haiti, I we were building this project, and I think we needed like $200,000 or something. And I thought to myself, man, what would it be like to be able to just strike a tre- check for 200 grand? Because I wasn't at that point. And, and I thought that would be awesome. And I actually heard a story about Tony Robbins from a guy who used to work for him, and they were down at an orphanage. I don't even know where they were. And... Um, he asked the guy that ran the orphanage, like, how much does it cost to run this place? And the guy was like, oh, it's about 150 grand a year is our budget. And Tony said, well, we'd love to cover the cost of the next year. And that wasn't a publicity stunt. Nobody knows about it. The only, this guy only knows because he was there. And like that kind of impact, that kind of contribution to me, all of a sudden got me excited about growing again. Because now there's a lot bigger purpose in making more money than just like add another zero. Mm. And, and people always think like, I always want to make more money. Well, sure, like money's great. It lets you do fun things, you know? Like we got to go out on a boat the other day. You can't do that without money. I get to live in a nice house with my kids and go on vacations with my family. I can't do that without money. We, we're sitting in a nice podcast studio and can't do that without money. But at some point, the money has to be more than just the, the, the dollars in the bank. and. And having that vision for like, man, what 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 kind of impact could we have? And we're capable of more, so why not do it? And then why not make change? Mm. Uh, one of our core values at Path for Growth is strength is for service. Mm. We say it at the end of every podcast, my strength is not for me, your strength is not for you, our strength is for service. And one of these recognitions that I'm constantly reflecting on is just the idea that like, we have a responsibility, I believe, to become outrageously strong. Like you have a responsibility to max out everything that God's given you and to push it to the nth degree. Like how far can you go with this thing called life? But it turns out that that strength isn't just for the sake of strength. That strength isn't for the golf course. That strength isn't just for you to build this tower dedicated to you. That strength is for service, right? And it's literally, you're supposed to become strong literally so you can spend all of it. And that's what I thought of whenever you were talking about Haiti, I'd love to know, is there a specific story that you can point to out of all the times you've been there at the foundation that really catalyzed some mindset shift or really created a shift in your way of thinking whenever it happened, or it was like an aha moment? Well, I think one of the biggest things for me was when I first got to the property um, years ago that we had just purchased it's this giant 
hill and it's beautiful country i mean if anybody's never been there or seen photos like you they often just show the photos of like the dirty destroyed downtown areas but like the countryside of haiti is stunning i mean it's tropical paradise but i'm standing on this hill as a florida boy who's used to flat land going i don't know what we're gonna do with this like it's beautiful but like i had no vision mm. and and there was something really powerful like i said earlier about being kind of the helper to somebody else's vision in that scenario. And what was so cool and what is so cool now is I remember there's certain things that just get burnt in your mind, you know, in life. And I remember those those kids' faces that came running up and they would just yell, Blanc, 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 which means white, white, white. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm aware. I'm, yes, I'm very white. I'm getting sunburnt right now. Um, and And they just they were so excited to see someone new, you know, it's not normal for them and they weren't asking for anything. They just wanted to play. And, um, now I'll see those same kids, but I'll see them at soccer camp. I'll see them at church. I'll see them at VBS. I'll see them accept Christ. Like I'll see them, these little boys who grow up in a culture where it is normal for women to abuse women. I mean, for men to abuse women, that is a normal part of the culture in many areas. And, and these boys are learning something different. Mm. And like uh, marriage is a very uncommon thing there. Um, and uh, um, my videographer, Peter, and I have both been down there and we got to go to a wedding. Um, and they, they film like, they'll, they'll do like six weddings at one time. And the impact of seeing like real life change, um, it, it just gives you a different perspective of what's possible in mm. life, you know? and. And so a long time ago, well, it wasn't that long ago, but uh, quite a few years ago, I, I thought I was supposed to be in ministry. I thought I was supposed to be a pastor. Mm. And I had somebody tell me the most impactful thing um, at a lunch one time. I was struggling with what to do. Should I sell this business? Should I pack it up? Should I just make it a side thing and be a pat? What, what should I, like, I feel like I'm being called by God to be in ministry. And he said, well, what makes you think you have to be in ministry to be in ministry? And I was like, oh. Right. Mm. He's like, you don't think God can use you in business? And I was like, well, he's like, don't you think that's where your gifts are? And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it turns out, yes. <laughs> and so then when you see the ministry impact of something that's happening in Haiti mm. or anywhere, like it doesn't have to be Haiti, it could be anywhere that, yeah. that you're seeing impact, you go, man, the, the things that we're doing here, yes, they're helping accomplish our core mission, which is to help other people grow their business. But think about the multiplier effect. If, if we get to use the, 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 the profits that come from that to, to, to create contribution and all the businesses that we help grow, what if they were similarly mission-minded? Mm -hmm. what, what if they were able to create impact in their own areas and their own communities or in, 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 in foreign areas that they're passionate about and know people in that, that I might never go to or know anything about? that's all of a sudden a heck of a lot more impactful than just building websites or launching social media campaigns. Gosh, yes. We uh, <laughs> we could get on the stump real quick <laughs> if we wanted to. And it's like, there's so, I mean, like there is so much discussion today talking about how capitalism is evil and yeah. it's a failed system. And I just get so freaking frustrated with it. And I know the people we're talking to, like most of you agree with me. Like we could sit down and commiserate together about how stupid those people are that are calling it a failed system because it's the greatest system the world's ever seen yeah. because of stuff like this. But maybe instead of just complaining about the people that call it a failed system, maybe go prove that it's the right system. Right. right? And so like, that's what I love about what you're doing is it's like, we're not just going to sit around and talk about how crazy it is that half the country thinks socialism is now a viable option. No, go show the world that capitalism works for everyone. Right. Make a ridiculous amount of money and be ridiculously generous with it. That's and, right. and, 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 and like, just stop, stop talking about it and go do something. Like we spend so much time like being worried about what somebody said on social media or what we saw on the news or whatever. Turn all that off, go make a lot more money and then give it all away. Oh, yes, freaking yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, drop the mic. If we could drop these mics, we would <laughs> do it right now. So we can't yeah, it that's right. Um, okay, I, I didn't tell you or I didn't really even think about doing this until uh, we were just talking about this. I'm sure there's a link we could put in the show notes of this episode that if people wanted to donate to the foundation. Yeah, they absolutely. Could do that. Yeah, I'll put a link in that. That'd be great. Awesome. Okay, we'll make sure we do that. Okay, uh, so we hit certainty, we hit uncertainty, we hit human connection, we hit contribution, and now 
now, you kind of honestly set us up for growth perfectly with what you just said. Yeah. Whenever I thought about this topic of growth, like ever since I met you, you are someone that stands out as, man, you've always got a book that you're reading or three books or five books that you're reading, right? You're always learning from other people. You have your own podcast where you're interviewing people regularly to learn from them. You're always going to different events and things like that. You're involved in so much. And and uh, I think so often we see someone like that, we're like, man, that person is growing. That's growth. But one of the things that I've noticed, there's a lot of people that are doing all that and they're kind of doing it as a facade for not actually doing work. Yeah. And one of the things that's been so cool about getting to come down and visit your office and spend time with your team is I'm getting to see the evidence of, oh, Jay doesn't just read these things. Like Jay is actively applying these things. And his team is like, I can see evidence of Entree Leadership's influence. And I can see evidence of EOS's influence. And I can see influence of Don Miller and StoryBrand's mm -hmm. influence. And it's like, there's there's little pieces of everything that it's like, it's like this collage of everything you've learned over the past yeah. 22 years, which is awesome. I'd love to know, like, did that come naturally? The saying, like, I'm not just gonna read these books, I'm gonna apply them, or how did you develop that skill? Gosh, I don't know how I developed that skill. I think um, I was such a bad reader, I am a very slow reader in general, that it had to like be intentional, I had to have value out of it. So mm. I didn't realize this until my second son, he, he's um, pretty severely dyslexic. And as I was going through all of his symptom lists, I was like, oh, maybe that's why I'm slow reading. Dyslexia is also genetic, so sorry about that, Oliver. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm a very slow reader, so I didn't read for a very long time, and I had to learn to become intentional about reading. So audiobooks are a big thing for me. When I say I read a book, I usually mean I listen to it. But what I'll do is I'll listen to the book, then if I really like it, I'll buy the physical copy. I'll listen to it again, but at a faster speed with a pen in my hand mm. so that I can take notes in that book so I can retain that information. Because if I don't, I won't do anything with it. And, and I think that's, I think it's also just a pet peeve of mine that people will spend so much money at events and stuff and then not take anything away. I mean, the very first like big event for me was an Entree Leadership event. It was almost 10 years ago. Gosh, um, you were one of the OGs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, now they're like building a new event center and everything, it's gonna be amazing. Um, but back then, the money to go to that event and even the three day, three, four days away for business was a lot. It was a significant investment for me and that was scary. Yeah. And I knew, I knew that I had the money, but it was like, I had to decide where that money was gonna go. I knew I needed to grow. I knew I needed like, I knew I needed some help because I was still just winging it. And um, and I invested in, in that you know time. And, and as a result of that, I knew I had to get something out of it. Mm. So I didn't have another option. You know, when I started my business, my parents had just gotten divorced and my mom didn't have any money. And there were, I have four younger siblings and like, I didn't have another option, you know? And so like, I had to figure it out. Mm. And I think that, you know, that like when I was a kid, that, that was a hard season. I was going to my senior year of high school, my parents got divorced and I had to figure it out. There wasn't room for me at my mom's apartment. I had to figure it out, you know? Mm. And and like, what a blessing that hard to those hard times were, Ugh. you know? I think there could be something in that connected to the idea of uncertainty too. It's like, you are still putting yourself in a position proactively that you have to figure some stuff out. Right. And it's like, there's things that you're doing now that you weren't doing three years ago that if you don't read some books, go to some events, meet some people, listen to some podcasts, you fail. And so it's like, sometimes I think people think like, oh, I'm not growing just because I'm not wired that way. And it's like, well, maybe you need to put yourself in a position where you literally have no other other option. Right. And like you have to take action. Like you have to take action. Right. But if you schedule an event, like if you schedule a live event like you did, you've got to figure out a lot of how to do a lot of things for the first time that kind of demands that you grow. And I told people you know, when we did that event, you know, I said the worst thing you could possibly do is show up here and not do anything. And I said, I don't care if it's one thing. Some of you just need to do one thing when you leave here that could make a change. And if this mm -hmm. event helped you do that, then so be it. I mean, my podcast and my book came from listening to Simon Sinek at an event, at an Entre Leadership event actually years ago. And he was talking about kind of like what the next stage is gonna be and like what kind of platform you're gonna have and asked him a couple of questions. And he was like, so why don't, why don't you just do it? And I was like, I don't really know. Like sometimes we just need somebody <laughs> to ask us a dumb question. Like that's a dumb question. Like why don't you just do it? Well, good question. Let me just go do it. That's right. Just so go I wrote for the it. first chapter of the book on the way home. You know, and and so when I now go, I go to events like that all the time now because it's not it's not as impactful for me to spend a few days away. I also know I'm going to meet a lot of new people that could become clients or friends or or whatever. Um, 
but back then, like the reason I did it in the early days, the reason I ha was intentional about growth afterwards is that I had to be. Mm. Because for me to spend a couple thousand dollars and several days away at an event was monumental back then. Mm. And so like I knew I had to turn it into something. And so because of that, I think I just learned um, that I had to take something away. And I think some people think they have to take all the things away, and that's a mistake, is that you don't have to do all the things that you learn in an event. You really only need a handful. That's right. If, if you listen to 10 different talks and you only take one good thing away from each talk, that is more than enough if you execute on it. Mm. Ideas are useless if you don't execute. And so, you know, that has just been revolutionary for me is like what – what, what can I take away from this? But in the early years, it wasn't out of like my innate nature or because somebody taught it to me. It was just because I had to. Mm. So on this topic of growth, are there specific books that stand out as having been the most impactful with regard to the way you think or act? I mean, as far as books go, Entre Leadership is probably like the one like that stood out to me in the earliest of days, but there's been so many since then. Um, e Myth had a big impact on me because he talks about this idea of like there's three types of people: the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. Mm. And I saw all three of those people in myself and thought, well, which one of these am I really? And I think I thought I was the technician, and really I was the entrepreneur. Mm. And and when you understand where that is, it changes everything. Anything by Patrick Lencioni, anything by Simon Sinek, like all those people have had huge impacts. Michael Hyatt has a huge impact on me. Um, Never even met the guy, but I've read all of his books, you know, mm. and sometimes things like that, um, those people can be mentors and you, they don't even know that the, you're their mentor. That's the beauty of access that we have in this content. Um, and now we have podcasts. I mean, that wasn't a thing when, when I started businesses, po the podcasts weren't a thing. Like, right. and now I have mine, you've got a podcast. There's, there's so much stuff we can hear from like the smartest, most intelligent people in the whole world. We can peek in on their conversations and it's just amazing. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's absolutely wild. The amount of info, like the knowledge is power thing. It's like that whole idea is kind of dead because it's like, well, we all have access to the knowledge now. Like, so it's not like you, it's whether you go get the knowledge that's actually a power. Like, can you can you search for the podcast? Can you look it up on Google? Can you talk to the person? Because we have access, right. which is such a crazy thing. Uh, so associate with that question of what have been the most impactful books. How do you choose what you read next? Gosh, I'd like to tell you that there's some kind of grand strategy, but <laughs> there's really not. Usually, like, it'll, I'll be listening to a podcast, so I'm almost always reading, like, a couple of books at a time. Yeah. The latest one I just finished that I really liked was uh, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. I've not read anything else by him before, but he's a smart guy, really cool stuff. Um, and it's usually because somebody mentions it on a podcast yeah. or I, at, I'm at an event and somebody says, you should read this. Now, I'll just kind of keep a little list, or a lot of times what I'll do... I've got one of those Audible subscriptions, and if it sounds really interesting, I'll just go into Audible and buy that book, and it's just then sitting on my thing. And now mm -hmm. I need to go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna get through it. One of the things I used to always do is I'd buy books, like I'd buy physical copies, knowing that I was such a slow reader, I'm never gonna read it, or it would take me ages to get through it. And I just they, you know, every, a lot of y'all are doing this. You're stacking up those books on your end table, your nightstand. They're, you're, they don't they don't get in your brain. You cannot. The longer you leave them there on your nightstand, they do not get in your brain. Yeah. Did you? Uh, I think you were at that summit, the John Maxwell. Were you at this one where he was like, I might have been. "Turns out you have to read the book," and he <laughs> yeah, rubs it all yeah, over his body. So yeah, this doesn't do it. It doesn't do it by osmosis, like. That's so true. But yeah, I mean, I've been guilty of that too, yeah. right? But it's it's like, it seems like a lot of times it's like the best book to read next is the one you'll read and just go it for it. it. Like is. I've learned leadership lessons from Lord of the Rings That's and that right. has taught me that it's like, you don't have to have the exact right book. Just read something. Just have, because a lot of times the thoughts associated with what you're reading are actually where the gold can be sometimes. But I think too that this is where like being in the right community with other business leaders is really valuable. That's so good. Because very often- the right next book is the book that's going to help you either get to where you want to go, so accomplish a goal mm -hmm. or a vision uh, or a dream, or um, solve a problem. So I, I need the book to do one of those two things, help take me in the right direction or help me solve a problem I'm currently experiencing. And so if you're in community with other people who are like-minded and, and, sh and have a similar mindset, and you say, gosh, I'm really struggling with this, most often other like growth-minded leaders are going to go, and this is what I do, oh, you should read this and then this and then this. And I'm like, okay, great. That's and then right. you just do that. You know? When you have that recognition too, it's like when you realize, man, 
I'm surrounded by growth minded leaders right now. They all value reading. You can think to yourself like, this person has probably read at a minimum 100 books that I have never and may never read. Like, if I'm not learning right now, that's on me, yeah, right? Absolutely. I should be asking questions like crazy right now because it's like they know something I don't. Um, okay, so we hit on certainty, uncertainty, human connection, contribution, growth, and the final piece that's so powerful as like a human need mm -hmm. is significance. Mm -hmm. So speak to like, I think this kind of hits on the idea, why is it all worth it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you kind of already hit on this some related to what you learned after coming back from Haiti, but what's your deep seated why for this business and what makes you believe in a higher purpose bigger than just we're building a company that served people? Yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately for me, everything is grounded in my faith, mm. you know? And I know everybody's got different beliefs on all kinds of things, especially when you start talking about the supernatural. But um, for me, it's a question ultimately of who is God and what does he desire of me? Mm. And if I believe, which I do, that I'm a child of God and he's in, given me certain gifts, talents, and abilities, shouldn't I use those to the maximum extent while I'm here? Mm. Because the reality is, you know, I was at a funeral the other day and we we're all going to be at a funeral, but be the one that's in the casket one day. Like we are, none of us are getting out of here alive. Mm. And so the question becomes like, what am I going to do with the time from when I'm born to when I die? And we don't get to know when we die. And, and does it matter? You know, I was listening to a podcast the other day. It was really interesting for me and a little hard. And I know people listening probably have all kind of different faiths, but um, it was Joe Rogan and Elon Musk. I mean, Elon's like the modern day Albert Einstein, you know, the guy's a genius <laughs> yeah. and weird as I'm can be. I'm not convinced he's a human being. I'm not, I'm not a sure. like, he might be an I alien I think why he's robot. taking us to Mars is because that's where he actually <laughs> came from. That's like where his home base is. <laughs> but he was talking about this and I, I wish that Joe would ask him one more question, which was Joe, I mean, um, Elon was talking about how much he cared about planning a colony on Mars. And the reason he cared about that was that humanity needs to be able to leave earth in order for at some point like a thousand years from now humanity survives some kind of extinction level event and i just thought to myself but man you're not going to be here and and he doesn't believe in like anything else he, he i mean it's from everything i've ever heard him say he believes this is just the end like it's just you just turn into dirt and so if that's true then like why do you care mm. I don't, I don't understand that. And, and I'd love to ask him, like, I'd love to ask him, like, why? Why do you want to do that? Because to me, you know, it, significance is ultimately about fulfilling, like, my calling as a child of God. And, and some people are like, that's, that's weird. Uh, that's fine. But that's what it is for me. And, and also, I think, you know, when I think about the future, we were talking about this the other night over dinner, and it was the first time I'd realized this, that when I close my eyes... And I think about what my life's going to look like when I'm 75 years old. As a visionary of this business, and this may or may not be scary for my team, I can't, I can't see the business. I don't know what, and it doesn't, doesn't, I don't know what I did with it. I don't know what, I, maybe it's still there. I, I don't know, even know what it looks like, but it's, it's, it's not significant in the context of me as a 75-year-old. Mm. But I can picture the porch I'm sitting on and the rocking chair I'm sitting in and the bourbon I'm drinking, and the same wife that's still sitting next to me, and I can picture my children there with their grandchildren, and I can picture the lawn, I can picture a dock, and I can picture a boat on the dock, and I can picture taking the kids out on a jet ski. Like, I can see all of those things, and I can see them crystal clear. And all of that, ultimately for me, is creating a legacy, not in money or in things, but in people. But why people? People because God created people for relationship. Mm. And and so to me, like, that is why I do what I do. Mm. And and all the other things come into play, and it doesn't always sound that pretty. Like, let's be clear. Like, it is really messy a lot of days. But like, that's the why for me. Mm. It's it's a belief that I was made for more, and so shouldn't I fulfill that? Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That's pretty powerful. And one of the things that I think about associated with that and with the Elon Musk example as well is uh, Proverbs 1-7 is fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, mm. right? And 
it's like, I think whenever it talks about fear there, I know it's not terror, right? It's, it's reverence and awe and deep seated respect. And you're just recognizing the glory of God. But I think you don't even necessarily have to be someone that has yet fully surrendered your life to Christ or committed, committed your life to the same God that you and I believe Mm in for you to fear God and therefore get wisdom. Because I think that someone that has that deep seated awe and respect is someone that has the guts to just ask the God question mm-hmm. and just says, I'm I'm not gonna get this wrong and I'm not gonna just dismiss it and live life the way I want to on my terms. I'm actually gonna wrestle with it. Yeah. And it's like, that that's the thing that I, I want so bad for business leaders. You do not have to believe what we believe at all, right? But what I do want for for you is have the guts to ask the question and don't operate under the assumption that this business is ever going to mean fulfillment for you because that's that's not where fulfillment comes from. I really like, I don't think there's any evidence that that's where fulfillment comes from. And so just start the wrestle is what I would say. Um, Man, Jay, I'm so grateful to you uh, for taking the time to do this and and for having me uh, down here to spend time with your team, absolutely. But I think even more than all of that, I'm just so grateful for your example. Like what's so cool is we didn't get to just talk about a bunch of theories today. Um, we got to talk about a bunch of stories related to the life that you've lived over the past 22 years. And that's an inspiration to me personally, just as a person, as a leader, as a man, as a Christ follower. And I know it is for so many other people, um, just the life that you're living and the example that you're setting. So thank you for that. Before I ask you the final question, I- I'd love for people to know where they can, they can find you, where they can find business builders and how they can connect with you online. Yeah, you can find uh, all the links to my company, Business Builders, and me on YouTube and everything else uh, just by going to jowenlive.com. It's J-A-Y-O-W-E-N live.com. Killer. And their new website looks absolutely wonderful as well. Y'all have done a killer job with it. Uh, We'll put all those links in the show notes along with all the resources and books and things that he mentioned as well. Final question for you is we just unpacked a lot for people. And I think one of the things that you hit on even with your team some yesterday in the meeting that I was observing is the need for them to do a little bit of introspection and say, okay, out of everything that I've just heard, what do I need to apply? What is the challenge that you would give people out of everything we've talked to or out of everything we've talked about for the past hour in terms of how they can make this actionable and how they can make this applicable? Yeah. Of all the things that we talk about today, the, the thing that is one of the most important that's had the most impact on me and I've seen it have impact on others is to ask the question, who are those four people that I talked about that are in your life? Mm. And if you don't have them, go find them. Somebody to look up to, um, someone who's standing beside you, someone who's looking up to you and someone who believes in you when you don't believe in yourself. Mm. If you have those four people in your life, it doesn't matter how your business is going. Like, there are going to be really bad days in business. That is normal. And if you're not like, don't for a second think like, well, it sounds like Jay's really got it all together. Like <laughs> I assure you there's plenty of times that I don't. And, um, and even after 22 years of business, there's some days where I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. And the longer I'm in business, the more I feel like most people are still not quite sure what they know what they're doing. <laughs> Turns out everyone's that's, making it up. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But in the midst of all of that, you have good direction. L- look, Look, look to where you want to go and ask the simple question, what needs to be true today in order for that to be true tomorrow? But find those four people. Um, and if you do that, everything in life is going to be a lot better off. Mm. Jay, grateful for you, man. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Alex.